Good afternoon and um, welcome to our Northern Latitudes webinar series. Um, this is Amy Postwitz. I'm the science coordinator with the Northwest Boreal Landscape Conservation Cooperative um, based out of Fairbanks. Um, this is a webinar series that the five LCCs that intersect Alaska host every other Tuesday. Um, and today we're happy to have uh, Kim Lisko and Fiona Schmigelow presenting from uh, Whitehorse in the Yukon on conserving large landscapes, um, science to support proactive planning. So Kim and Fiona are in Whitehorse today, and then there's small groups of us gathered in, in Fairbanks and Anchorage as well. And then um, thank you to all of, all of you joining us on the phone and from your computers. Um, the webinar will be recorded, and we'll share that information with everyone afterwards. Um, Mary McFadden with the Great Northern LCC is running the webinar set up for us today out of Bozeman, Montana, and she's going to be helping us to keep track of questions. So if you're in front of your computer, you can enter questions into the question box, and you'll also be able to, to ask them um, live after the presentation. We are going to save questions until the end. Um, Fiona or Kim, can you move to the next slide for me? Um, I just want to mention really quickly a couple of other upcoming webinars in the series. Um, two weeks from now, we'll have Kate Legner with the U.S. Forest Service presenting on their inventory program. And then we'll be taking a little bit of a break um, over the holidays. And when we come back on January 9th, um, Sarah Cook will be presenting on the Shore Zone program. And Fiona, you can go to the first slide in your presentation. Um, I just want to start with a, a brief introduction of our presenters today before they get started talking about the Beacons Project. Um, so Fiona Schmigelow is a professor of wildlife and landscape science at the University of, of Alberta. And Fiona's worked extensively across the boreal regions of Canada, um, Alaska and beyond with a wide range of partners. And since 2009, her university position has been assigned to the Yukon Territory, where she established and directs a Northern Environmental and Conservation Sciences program in partnership with Yukon College. Um, and Fiona's work is inspired by the spectacular landscape and the colorful people of the North. Um, Kim Lisko is the project manager for the Beacons Project. And Kim's primary interest is ecologically sustainable resource development and the maintenance of resilient landscapes. And to that end, Kim has led multi-party conservation planning across the boreal, including benchmark design from Alaska to Newfoundland. Prior to joining the Beacons Project, Kim studied and coordinated research on the effects of industrial development on the ecology of boreal wildlife, including birds, weasels, flying squirrels, and caribou. Um, and with that, I'm going to um, pass this over to Kim and Fiona to give the presentation. Thank you, Amy. Is my voice coming through all right? Yes, coming through great. Okay, great. Well, it's a pleasure for us to have the opportunity today to share our work with the Northwest Boreal Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Those of us privileged to live and work in the landscapes that comprise this region are faced with enormous opportunities and significant challenges. And bringing science to bear on these issues is the focus of our presentation today. Northwest Canada and Alaska contain some of the most intact landscapes and waterscapes found anywhere in the world. These intact landscapes support natural ecological processes and functional ecological communities, including a full complement of top predators. These are also attributes that are globally significant in these times of change. These landscapes also support many other values, including rich cultural resources and vibrant communities, and many natural resources of economic interest. There are also systems that are inherently dynamic and remain shaped by large natural disturbances, such as wildfire and insect outbreaks. And they're experiencing some of the most rapid and dramatic effects of climate change felt anywhere on Earth. And this is affecting both the natural systems and the communities and infrastructure associated with them. 
There's also increasing interest in development of the abundant natural resources in the region, which presents both opportunities and risks. So the challenge presented to us is in moving from reactive measures that are largely focused on managing scarcity to planning proactively to maintain the full range of values that this region currently supports, including the resource potential. In this context, it's important to revisit conservation paradigms. The classic conservation model arose largely in response to crisis situations where natural landscapes had extensively been converted by human activities and remnant natural areas were embedded in a highly altered matrix that had lost most of its ecological function and was often hostile to the species occupying the natural remnants. These situations resulted in many questions regarding how much is enough or what percentage of lands must be protected in order to achieve conservation goals in these highly altered systems. This is an important question, but in isolation, it does not address the full range of conservation potential that could be realized in carefully managed systems, particularly those that may remain largely intact and support a high level of ecological integrity. In largely natural systems, including boreal regions of Northwest Canada and Alaska, where the vast majority of land still maintain high conservation value, it's equally important to ask how much is too much? How much and what sort of development can be supported such that the natural and cultural values and integrity of the region are not compromised by such activities? We refer to this as a conservation matrix model, where the matrix is a supportive environment that sustains these values and within which a variety of land uses occur ranging from strict protection to regulated resource development at appropriate scales. And unlike conventional approaches, the conservation matrix model redirects efforts from reactive to proactive conservation planning. And these considerations contributed the need to carefully consider the sustainability of development activities in advance. In highly altered landscapes, we've often exceeded the capacity of natural systems to absorb the changes associated with human activities, resulting in a loss of ecological integrity and associated values. At the other end of the spectrum, we recognize that natural systems have characteristic integrity and resilience. The challenge is to identify a framework for sustaining ecological and sociocultural systems, given these inherent uncertainties, and to minimize the risk of unintended outcomes from desired economic opportunities. So we can pose a question, what is the domain of sustainability in these systems? Now, in order to do this, we need to recognize that our quest for sustainability really is a grand experiment. Uncertainties and outcomes are related to a number of factors, many of which are particularly acute in boreal regions of Northwest Canada and Alaska. For example, our state of understanding of basic system dynamics is relatively poor. This extends in some cases to even coarse distributional data on species of concern. We understand that northern systems experience substantial fluctuations due to natural variation in climatic conditions and resultant effects on plants and animal communities, but our ability to accurately predict the outcomes of such, such fluctuations on populations is limited. Furthermore, the present and anticipated effects of more dramatic climate change in the north introduce additional uncertainties regarding the outcome of management activities. Finally, the social context in which management activities take place influences response to uncertainties, particularly regarding the level of risk that local communities are willing to assume in association with potential development activities. And all of these uncertainties increase risk. Active adaptive management was developed as a science-based approach to address uncertainties inherent to resource management and to minimize risk. It recognizes the need to support local communities and economies while avoiding foreclosure of future opportunities and accomplishes this by enhancing learning through management choices that are designed to reduce uncertainties. Key to maintaining flexibility is the incremental application of management actions as experiments. So proceed, but proceed with caution. And a fundamental requirement of experiments is that they require controls. 
And in the context of the conservation matrix model and implementation of adaptive resource management, we refer to such controls as ecological benchmarks. We'll take a moment now to illustrate the role of ecological benchmarks in the context of adaptive management. So imagine a resource management area that's undergoing development activities. One, questions of in, one question of interest might be to know how the activities are affecting species of concern. If we observe a decline in that species, can we conclude that the decline is a result of management activities? If we observe a similar decline in ecological benchmarks, then we know that the decline is due to something other than management practices, for example, climate change. However, if there's no decline observed in the benchmarks, then we can attribute the change to the management activities, which may require adjustment in order to mitigate, mitigate those risks. And this is where we integrate what have historically been quite different disciplines or disparate disciplines, the science of resource management in the field of conservation science. We typically publish this work in different journals, we go to different conferences, and we have management agencies that are separate. However, this integration is key to identifying solutions for achieving sustainability. So just to summarize, the conservation matrix model is a science-based approach to landscape sustainability. It's proactive and comprehensive. It focuses on maintaining the processes that support ecological integrity rather than managing to minimum levels, often critical levels. It recognizes the contribution that all landscape elements can make to achieving conservation sustainability. And in doing so, encourages stewardship and innovation through integrated and active adaptive management. Uh, now I'm going to shortly turn the um, the uh, controls over to Kim, and uh, Kim will ta be talking about some work on benchmarks, identifying benchmarks across the Northwest Boreal LCC. Thank you, Fiona. Before proceeding with the details of the work, we would like to acknowledge the primary research team, which included Fiona and I, as well as Mark Edwards, Pierre Vernier, and Alberto Suarez Esteban. We would also like to acknowledge other members of the Beacons team that have played a significant role in developing the underlying concepts and methods uh, that you'll see applied today. And that includes Sean LaRue at Memorial University, Meg Krawchuk at Oregon State University, and Steve Cumming at Laval University. As Fiona mentioned, ecological benchmarks are controls or reference areas for improving our understanding of boreal systems and for identifying sustainable management practices that support ecological integrity as well as maintain resilience on the landscape. And as such, ecological benchmarks are designed to be large and intact, to capture both terrestrial and aquatic systems, and to be representative of, of environmental variation or to be representative of the representative of the region for which they're to serve as a control. For the Northwest Boreal LCC, we identified and assessed benchmark networks using three sets of inputs. Benchmark networks were first designed using the fundamental attributes of intactness, size, hydrology, and representation. And then we ranked those networks based on resilience to climate change and the representation of focal species habitat. And so for this presentation, I'm going to take you uh, through each of those three inputs. So first we'll start with the fundamental attributes. So ecological benchmarks are designed to be in, in, intact. By in, intactness, we mean the absence of a conspicuous uh, human footprint. And intactness serves as a proxy for ecological and evolutionary processes operating within their natural range of variation or without the influence of human activity. And so for this analysis, we quantified intactness using two data sets that were harmonized across the Canada-Alaska border, which included the Alaska landscape condition model of, produced by Jamie Trammell and others at the Alaska Center for Conservation Science at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And in Canada, we used the Global Forest Watch Canada's human access data set. 
There are two primary factors that guide the size of ecological benchmarks. First, benchmarks are designed to capture the large-scale eco ecological processes that create those patterns that we see in the landscape. And so natural disturbance, such as fire, is an example of a large-scale process that plays a significant role in shaping the landscape structure of the Northwest Boreal Region, as well as the adaptations of many of its organisms. So by capturing the natural disturbance regime, uh, namely fire, we have some confidence that benchmarks can also support the natural function of processes operating at finer scales. So in addition to maintaining natural disturbance, fire, the benchmark must also be resilient to that natural disturbance. So for example, here we have a reserve or benchmark shown in purple and a flammable habitat type that is vulnerable to fire shown in green and a species that relies on that habitat. A benchmark must be of sufficient size to experience large, severe fires while maintaining these vulnerable habitat types or internal recolonizations, or we can even think of them as lifeboats of vulnerable habitat types. And it's through maintaining these lifeboats that the benchmark can continuously support effective monitoring of biodiversity and the implementation of adaptive management. We refer to reserves that are sufficiently large to capture the natural disturbance regime, as well as maintain these lifeboats as minimum dynamic reserves. Minimum dynamic reserves for the Northwest Boreal were estimated uh, using dynamic landscape simulation modeling, which required that we harmonized uh, data sets, including fire maps, both polygon and point, fire models and vegetation succession rules across the Alaska-Canada border. We estimated minimum dynamic reserves at the size of ecoregions. So this map here shows ecoregions outlined in black, and they're colored based on the relative size of the MDR value, which is shown in black bold. So we can see that minimum dynamic reserve estimates for the Northwest Boreal LCC range from 338 to roughly 15,000 square kilometers, or 130 to 6,000 square miles. Hydrology often has been neglected in reserve design to the detriment of biodiversity conservation. We explicitly incorporate hydrology in the design of benchmarks through the capturing of headwaters as well as lateral and longitudinal connectivity. Protecting the long-term ecological integrity of both aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems requires a foundation of intact and functional headwaters because as the primary interface between upland and riparian areas and the overall stream network, Headwaters have several ecological functions which have influence on the, not only the structure, function, productivity, but also the biodiversity of downstream ecosystems. Also by capturing headwaters, we minimize threats to the ecological integrity of the benchmark from disturbances that could occur upstream and travel into the benchmark through the stream network. Longitudinal connectivity refers to movement along waterways while lateral connectivity is the surface flow of water, such as precipita precipitation falling and then flowing downhill. So integrate both, to integrate terrestrial connectivity with both lateral and longitudinal connectivity, we assemble benchmarks from catchments uh, along stream networks. And this figure here at the bottom shows an example of uh, catchments designed for the stream network. So we have the digital elevation model underneath the stream network shown in blue, and then the catchments outlined in red. And the catchments are the approximate drainage areas for the stream segments passing through them. So this data set was created for the Northwest Boreal LCC region and was harmonized across the Alaska-Canada border. Um, ideally, we would have also included vertical connectivity or the flow of groundwater. Um, however, we were only able to address surface flow because of the challenges of mapping and uh, modeling groundwater flow patterns. To assemble catchments into benchmarks, we have a software program called the Benchmark Builder. Benchmark Builder assembles benchmarks to a user-defined size and intactness. And for this analysis, we used a minimum catchment intactness of 80%. And of course, the size was the minimum dynamic reserve estimates that I showed earlier. So construction of a benchmark starts from a seed catchment, which is shown here outlined in red. The catchments are all outlined in gray. The numbers indicate the order in which the catchments are assembled together along the stream network, which is shown by the thin black lines. So construction starts from the seed catchment, and the software first grows upstream to prioritize the capture of headwaters. 
Once all headwaters have been captured, it moves downstream. Once it's moved downstream, it looks upstream again, adding upstream catchments, and will do so until it needs to move downstream, and repeats that process until the MDR size has been achieved. To evaluate representation, we used four indicators of environmental variation or biodiversity surrogates. This includes climate moisture index, which is a measure of soil moisture, gross primary productivity, which is a measure of the amount of carbon absorbed during photosynthesis, lake edge density or LED characterizes the density of riparian habitat, and for land cover, we used the 2010 North American land cover, which is based on 250 meter MODA satellite imagery. Now, just to give you a high level overview of where we are along the design process. So first we start with step one. So that's the design of benchmark areas based on size and tactness and hydrology. So imagine that this is our planning region and then we construct a suite of benchmark options for that planning region. Those benchmarks options are often highly overlapping. Then using our four measures of environmental variation, we assemble those benchmark areas into representative networks. And we usually find that at least two to three benchmarks are required to achieve representation. Once we have our suite of network options, uh, we then rank them based on a suite of criteria. And for the work within the Northwest Borough LCC, we looked at funda fundamental benchmark properties uh, resilience to climate change and the representation of focal species habitat. And so I'll go through each of those now. Benchmark networks were first ranked uh, based on properties, benchmark properties associated with external vulnerability, internal vulnerability, and hydrologic connectivity. For benchmarks to best serve as controls, the benchmark, sh benchmark should have little to no vulnerability to human disturbance via the stream network, edge effects, or internal sources. So while these characteristics are explicitly addressed in, in the design process, the quality of a benchmark can be compromised by interruptions to the automated construction process. And this can either be due to poor landscape condition or stoppage of construction once the size target has been met, which could leave the benchmark with incomplete headwaters. So to assess external vulnerability, we first looked at the amount of upstream area associated with the benchmark. So this figure here shows the benchmark area outlined in a red. You can see the stream network shown in light blue. Areas upstream of the benchmark are shown in the blue hatching. And these upstream areas occurred because of the low catchments, low catchment intactness associated with those neighboring catchment areas. External vulnerability was also assessed based on the intactness of those upstream areas. To assess uh, edge effects or the potential for edge effects, we looked at the shape of benchmarks. Irregular shapes should be avoided to minimize the intrusion of edge effects. And so we used the shape index that starts at the value of one, which is the equivalent of a, of a circle. And that shape value becomes higher as the benchmark shape becomes more convoluted. Internal vulnerability addresses the present presence of human disturbance uh, within a benchmark. So here we have an example again of the benchmark shown outlined in red. We have the stream network inside and then we have some low intact catchments. So these are areas that were excluded from the benchmark but do serve as a potential source of disturbance to or uh, vulnerability to the benchmark itself. And so internal vulnerability was measured as the proportion of area within the benchmark boundary of low intactness. And finally, to address hydrologic uh, connectivity, we use what's referred to as a dendritic connectivity index, which ranges from a value of zero to one, with one meaning a uh, perfect connectivity. So the A here shows a fully connected stream network where you can get from one point to another without interruption, whereas B here you can see due to these uh, three low intact catchments areas is now comprised of 10 isolated stream networks. Benchmark networks were also ranked with regards to climate change uh, using four climate projected data sets for the period of 2041 to 2070 using the RCP 8.5 or the representative concentration pathway with the highest greenhouse gas emissions from the IPC 2014 report. 
all these uh, data sets were derived using, using an ensemble of climate models. The boreal is predicted to experience significant warming and associated change over the coming decades, but the four indicators that we've used to design our representative benchmark networks uh, do not account for the influence of climate change and are based on current climatic conditions. So to address this, we ranked benchmark networks based on their ability to remain representative based on two measures of temperature and precipitation. To further assess the ability of benchmark networks to support biodiversity under climate change, we evaluated the potential for species to persist within or even to colonize benchmark networks. And this was done using forward and backward climate velocity respectively. So forward velocity, this measures the rate at which an organism in the current landscape has to migrate to maintain constant climatic conditions. And it's essentially a measure of refugia potential and lower forward velocity velocities indicate higher refugia potential for a benchmark, for example. So for each benchmark, we calculate a benchmark network, we calculated the mean forward velocity. Backward velocity uh, is the minimum rate of migration required of an organism to colonize a cell when moving from a cell of equivalent climatic conditions. And it is essentially a measure of how easy is it for the benchmark network to be colonized should the species have to move. And so mean backward velocity was calculated for each benchmark network. Lower backward velocities would indicate, or, would indicate higher colonization potential. Lastly, uh, benchmark networks were ranked based on the protection of habitat for the following list of priority focal species that were identified by the Northwest Boreal LTC partners. These species were selected based on vulnerability to landscape change, as well as social and or cultural importance, which makes them ideal candidates for monitoring programs to identify sustainable management practices. Prior to identifying uh, new benchmark areas, we evaluated the potential of existing protected areas using the fundamental attributes of intactness, size, hydrology, and representation. To identify represent, uh, representative benchmark networks, we stratified the Northwest Boreal planning region by ecoregions. Ecoregions how, boundaries, however, were not uh, delineated uh, to consider hydrology. So if we look at this figure here, we can see an ecoregion shown in black outline. We have the stream network underneath. And so we're just gonna zoom into this box here. So here again, we have the ecoregion boundary, and then we see the stream network, which is severed by the ecoregion boundary. So benchmarks designed for this ecoregion would have a fragmented uh, stream network around which to assemble. So to address that, we intersected the ecoregion with fundamental drainage areas in Canada, which are shown here in blue. And in Alaska, we use the equivalent known as the HUC-8 or the hydrologic unit code eight. And these units um, capture the majority of headwaters that would be associated with the ecoregion. So when designing and constructing benchmarks, construction would always start from catchments within the ecoregion, but as required, the benchmarks would be allowed to grow out into the surrounding region as dictated by hydrology. So now I'm going to dive into some of the results for the region. So this map here shows the overall benchmark potential so these are regions that support benchmarks, and these are benchmarks designed based on size, intactness, and hydrology. And so all of this green here underneath shows where we were able to um, identify benchmarks. The ecoregions are shown in black and then with their unique identifiers. And not surprisingly, given the high intactness of the region, over 90% of the Northwest Boreal LCC planning region supports the construction of ecological benchmarks. We then assembled these benchmarks into representative benchmark networks. And this figure here shows, uh, highlights the potential of, of each, the potential for the identification of representative benchmark networks within each ecoregion. So the ecoregions, again, you can see the outlines here shown in gray. And then the ecoregions are colored based on the composition of the benchmark network. So what do I mean by that? So as I mentioned earlier, before going about and designing benchmark networks based on new areas, we first evaluated existing protected areas for the potential to serve as representative benchmark networks. And those ecoregions that are highlighted in green, the existing protected areas network does a good job of benchmarking that ecoregion. 
For those ecoregions that are colored in blue, the existing protected areas contribute a benchmark to the benchmark network, but they're not sufficient in and of themselves. And so new benchmarks had to be added to the network. For those that are those ecoregions that are shown in, in pink, those ecoregions uh, require uh, solely new benchmarks to create representative benchmark networks. Uh, protected areas may contribute to some portions of those uh, new benchmark areas, but the protected areas on their own uh, do not form a benchmark. So now I'm going to zoom into Ecoregion 175 to show you what some of these uh, benchmark networks actually look like. So this is Ecoregion uh, 175. You can see the Ecoregion is shown in black outline. And then we have the intersecting hydrology units. We can see the outer outline shown here in blue. Each of these uh, networks is comprised of three benchmarks. In some cases, those benchmarks are overlapping, so they may look like one contiguous area such as in the case of network two here, or even uh, with network five, we can see we have two overlapping benchmarks located here. So you can see that there is some spatial variability and lots of options for uh, the selection of benchmark networks associated with this particular ecoregion. So now I'm gonna talk about uh, the suite of products that we've generated from this work. And for one ecoregion, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail around uh, what the ranking output looks like. So first of all, we before we could undertake the work, we had to generate a suite of transboundary data sets across the Canada-Alaska border. There's the minimum dynamic reserve analysis to, to support the design of benchmarks, which I spoke to earlier. Uh, there was a lot of work that went into the selection of focal species as well as the identification of data sets, et cetera. And then there's the benchmark analysis itself. So I'll take you through each one of these. So the transboundary data sets are wide and varied, include fire, vegetation, minimum dynamic reserves, intact landscapes, our catchment data sets, harmonized stream network, lake edge density, and gross primary productivity. Many of these data sets are already hosted on the USGS science-based catalog. And we're all, we will also be making these data sets available for download. Uh, again, the minimum dynamic reserve analysis that was done to support benchmark design. We have a full report detailing that work. The focal species. Uh, there's a main report that addresses the five primary objectives of this work, which included not only the selection of species, but also um, the gathering of conservation goals and targets, data sets and models, the identification of gaps, and then finally, the use of focal species in the design and selection of benchmark networks. So before uh, using focal species in assessing benchmark networks, we first wanted to know what was going on or what others were thinking elsewhere across the Northwest Boro LCC region. And so this, um, to do this, we gathered um, management plans from across the region and reviewed them for conservation goals and associated targets. So we have a bibliography of those plans as well as a table that uh, identifies goals and targets from all of those plans uh, for all of the focal species identified. Finally, uh, we then went out and looked for data sets and models that we could include in this work. So a suite or a vast number of species experts were consulted. So we have a list of those species experts. From those species experts, we get, uh, acquired an inventory of existing data sets and models, and then we acquired data sets. And so we have a suite of data sets that we incorporated in this work that included current and predicted habitat, habitat quality, such as the map showed here for uh, boreal chickadee, uh, abundance and nest density, as well as climate refugia. For the benchmark analysis, there's the main report, which speaks to the basics of benchmark design, methods, high-level results, as well as guidelines for users. And that main report is accompanied by a suite of ecoregion reports that dive into the results for each of the ecoregions. And those ecoregion reports speak to the benchmark potential of existing protected areas and regions that support the identification of benchmarks, the identification of candidate benchmark networks, and then the, the ranking of those benchmark networks based on fundamental benchmark properties, climate change resilience, focal species, and overall rank. And so now we're going to take a look at uh, some of the material and information that you can find in these ecoregion reports. 
So this is ecoregion 25, uh, just to orient you as to where we are. It's the Ray Mountains. It's located in Alaska in the north central region of the Northwest Barrow LCC. The report first opens up uh, with, a, with a summary table and a map. So we can the map here we can see the eco region outlined in uh, black again the the boundary of the hydrology units outlined in blue the red hatching shows the existing protected areas network the green underneath uh, identifies those regions that support the identification of uh, benchmarks and then the uh, peach areas here identify regions of the existing protected areas network that have the potential to contribute to representative benchmark network for the region. Unfortunately, in this case here, um, the amount of overlap associated with those potential benchmarks in the eco region was considered too small for us to consider them a potential benchmark for the region. Across the top here, we have the summary table, which includes the area of the eco region itself, the area of the planning region, so that would be the region within the uh, hydrology units, the minimum dynamic reserve size associated with that eco region, the number of protected area benchmarks, which I indicated was zero for here. The number of new benchmarks that we identified for the area was 121. And from one of those 121 benchmarks, we identified 115 candidate benchmark networks. Now, many of those benchmark networks were highly overlapping, so we assigned them to spatial groups. So we assigned those 115 to 13 spatial groups, and then for the purpose of reporting, we selected the top benchmark network from each of those groups and provided a ranking statistics. So this map here uh, shows the 13 benchmark networks that were selected for reporting in the Ecoregion report. Associated with each of those uh, Benchmark networks is their ranking associated on benchmark properties. So in this case, network N3 ranked third with regards to benchmark properties, seventh with regard to climate change, first with regard to focal species, and second overall. And so for each of these uh, numbers here, we have supporting tables within the report. So for fundamental benchmark properties, here we have our 13 networks. We have the benchmark properties associated with external vulnerability, internal vulnerability, and then our hydrologic connectivity. And then we have the overall ranking assigned to each of those uh, benchmark networks associated with statistical analysis. So here we can see that N3, based on the suite of properties, ranks third. Now we'll just skip down. To the climate change and focal species tables are similar. And so now we'll just skip down to the overall table. So here we have our 13 networks. We also report on the percent overlap with existing protected areas, which in this case ranges from about 10% up to 40%. And then we report on each of the rankings associated with benchmark properties, climate change, and focal species, then to provide an overall rank for that particular network. So N3 here has an overall rank of two. Finally, we have a suite of shapefiles associated with this work, which will be available for download. So we have shapefiles of all benchmarks that were generated for each ecoregion, including the area associated with those benchmarks uh, that's upstream. We also have shape files of all benchmark networks and then also the upstream area associated with those benchmark networks. And as I mentioned, those will all be available for download. We also have uh, the ranking tables are also available. So the raw table, the raw data and ranks are available and available in a table format that can be manipulated by the user. So users can choose to drop criteria and or apply an alternative ranking system depending on what their conservation objectives are. So there are tables for benchmark properties, climate change, and for each of the focal species. Finally, we have a website uh, where people can go and uh, explore the results through interactive maps and tables. So uh, we have the home page as an overview page. There's an ecoregion explorer. It's a drop down menu that will take you to each of the ecoregions and there's a download page. And so we'll go to the download page first. So here, you have access to all of the reports, as well as the data sets used in the analysis, including our four indicators of environmental variation and our focal species data sets. If you click on this menu here, you can go to a particular ecoregion where you'll find ecoregion specific products, including the ecoregion report, the ranking tables, and then the shape files associated with that ecoregion. Using the ecoregion explorer, you can then go to one of the ecoregions to explore the results. Here we have a map showing the ecoregion outlined in black and then the hydrology unit outlined again in blue. 
we have uh, three tabs across the top here, which include instructions, attributes, your ecoregion explorer again. We have a map view and we also have a table view of the results associated with this ecoregion. You can explore not only benchmark networks, but you can look at climate change and then each of the focal species that were present within that uh, ecoregion. So with each of these maps, you can turn on various, uh, sorry, for, we'll just go back here. So first we'll look at the attributes associated with um, the map that we're looking at. So if you go to this attribute uh, tab here, you can look at the description of the various rasters which are available for viewing with uh, the legends explaining those rasters here on the map. So we can turn on land cover, for example. You can turn on climate moisture index. You can turn on as many layers as you like, and then you can overlay your benchmark networks on top, including your, your protected areas. Next, you can go to the table, uh, the table view. The attributes are all described here. So if we pop over to the table view, we can see our 13 networks for this particular ecoregion the size of those networks, and then we can see their overall ranking here based on benchmark properties, climate change, focal species, and the overall rank, and you can resort this table by clicking here. So if you want to find out which one is ranked top with regards to climate change. All these pages have the same structure, so if we go to Caribou, you can see again we have the Instructions Attributes Ecoregion table. So we'll take a look at um, Caribou Herds here. Uh, you can click on the Caribou Herd to find out the name. You can also look at uh, habitat, for example, and turn on uh, your, your benchmark network. Again, we have the table attributes here and you can view the table here, which includes the amount of overlap with herd ranges, for example, amount of habitat, caribou occupied, et cetera, to an overall rank here of the networks at the end. And then finally, once you're done exploring that ecoregion, you can pop over to your ecoregion explorer and pop over to somewhere else. So that's an overview of the work that was produced and there's so much more that could be done and to enhance the products and how users might want to use them. So here's just a couple of examples. So up to this point, benchmark networks have been designed and ranked based solely on ecological values. However, land use planning often entails a range of values including cultural and socioeconomic considerations. So benchmark networks can be ranked based on their ability to contribute to other land use goals, such as the protection of berry picking sites and other culturally important areas. When selecting a benchmark network, we would also like to avoid conflict with existing and potential development so that we minimize risks not only to the ecological integrity of benchmark networks, but also risk to the socioeconomic interests of communities and local governments. And emerging data sets from the Northwest Boral LCC, such as the mining data set shown here, will be helpful in this regard. For example, here's an illustration of three networks uh, shown in purple, green, and blue. Um, and we show quartz mining claims here. Um, based on the overlay of these networks with the quartz mining claims, we can see that network three has no conflict with those mining claims, and so may want to, to be uh, ranked higher than the other two in terms of consideration for a benchmark network in this region. Regional data sets can also play a role in enhancing the work that we've done. So for example, more detailed uh, mining footprint data layers could be brought in to finesse the intact landscapes layer that we used in the analysis. In uh, northern BC, there's a detailed vegetation inventory which could be used instead of the uh, 250 meter resolution satellite data that we had for a more refined analysis. Regional focal species data sets could also be incorporated. When designing benchmark networks, uh, our MDR values were based solely on fire. However, in some regions such as northern BC, mountain pine beetle outbreaks are advancing north due to climate change. So uh, in Eastern Canada, we have developed methods to identify insect-based and uh, minimum dynamic reserve values, uh, which could be applied here um, or elsewhere in the Northwest Boreal LCC region. Finally, uh, no consideration was given to permafrost, but that's certainly something that could be included. So permafrost melt, uh, as most people are aware, is occurring across the region as, and is expected to continue in response to warming and uh, to 
occur with associated changes in hydrology leading to drier landscapes and altered habitats. So benchmark networks could be further evaluated and ranked based on minimizing vulnerability to uh, permafrost melt, as well as their ability to serve as controls for areas that are experienced permafrost melt. And so in addition to permafrost, uh, there are also a number of growing climate uh, change data sets and modeling tools that also could be used to evaluate the benchmark networks that, that we've identified for the Northwest Boreal LCC region. Okay, thank you, Kim. Uh, so I'm gonna take back the controls here for just a few minutes. Um, so it's been really rewarding for us to have the opportunity to develop and apply our work in partnership with the Northwest Boreal Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Some of the applications that we've been involved with or anticipate include the incorporation of benchmark scenarios into the Bureau of Land Management Resource Management Plans for the uh, Bering Sea Western Interior and Central Yukon planning regions and their application in adaptive resource management. The development of monitoring strategies for national wildlife refuge areas in Alaska um, and associate assessment of benchmark potential. We're looking forward to exploring applications of our work to regional land use planning in the Yukon. Land use planning has been on hold in the Yukon pending the outcome of a court case associated with the Peel Region Land Use Plan, which was the second planning process completed in the Yukon. The first was the, the North Yukon, uh, but the rest is yet to unfold as um, enabled by the umbrella final agreement. We're anticipating uh, a final decision on that case will actually be announced later this week. That was just uh, announced yesterday. That's from the Supreme Court of Canada. We similarly see many applications of our work in association with land use planning and resource management activities in the Northwest Territories. And our work can certainly inform the development of monitoring strategies, including those led by communities and indigenous populations throughout this region. Now really the underlying philosophy of our work is to recognize that realizing the potential for large landscape conservation and truly sustainable resource management requires shared stewardship by communities, industry and government agencies living and operating in these regions. Shared stewardship can encourage innovation in resource development and rapidly enhance learning um, to improve the knowledge base for management over time. That's really the key element of adaptive management. I'd like to just briefly mention that our work in advancing these concepts has not been restricted to the Northwest Boreal LCC, although we've spent much of the last couple of years working on this project. Um, we've been actively working with, uh, with partners across Boreal Canada to develop and apply these concepts and tools in a variety of conservation and land use planning processes. Uh, in terms of next steps, the as Kim mentioned, the reports and the products will be released very soon uh, on our project website um, and you can anticipate an announcement of that coming across the LCC network as well. We're also planning a series of webinars on how to use and apply the products and enhance the products and, uh, and those will be rolled out in the new year and also additional outreach efforts and materials are being prepared in partnership with the Northwest Boreal LCC and uh, Amy will make some follow-up comments regarding that just at the end of the webinar. And finally, just for a few acknowledgements, um, we'd like to close by first acknowledging that our work in the Northwest Boreal LCC has taken place on the traditional lands of many Indigenous groups who have occupied this region for millennia. And the condition of these landscapes is testimony to their long-term stewardship activities. And of course, this work would not have been possible without the financial support and close collaboration of a wide range of partners, many of which are whom are listed here. And on that note, uh, I'd like to just close off and thank you for uh, taking time to listen to us today and uh, hopefully we have a little bit of time for questions which I think Mary will be moderating. Yeah, thanks uh, Kim and uh, Fiona. Uh, we do have time for questions and we have a couple questions already in the queue, um, uh, questions folks have typed in. Just a reminder to folks, you can either type in your question in that questions pane and I'll read them to Fiona and Kim. Or if you like, you can ask your question by phone or computer mic. And to do that, but you should see a little toolbar where you can raise your hand and then I'll be able to unmute you and you can ask your question. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with the 
couple of questions that we have. The first one is, um, what cross-border digital elevation model did you use? Uh, have we got Pierre online? Well, they were, I'll just, I'll just answer. Um, I, I don't have the specific data sets in mind, but they were two data layers. The one used in Canada, I believe, was the Canada 3D elevation model at 1 to 50,000, which we then combined with a similar digital elevation model at 1 to 24,000. So those are different units, 1 to 24,000 and 1 to 50,000, those are different units. And we just combined those two layers to generate a digital elevation model for the region. Okay, thanks. Next question. Why is climate change resilience used as one of the metrics to identify priority benchmark sites? In protected areas network planning, we use the principle of planning a network that allows ecosystems to adapt to climate change, not resilience, not resiliency of a site to climate change. Protected areas are key benchmark areas, so I'm just curious about the discrepancy. Okay, so I think we should be clear that when we talk or use the term resilience, we're not necessarily talking about resistance in the sense of sort of engineering resistance, but ecological resilience. And we do use a couple of different metrics. So one, um, and of course, remember that these are also measured across a benchmark network. So the intent is to allow, um, to respect and acknowledge that those changes are going to happen over time. Uh, but to be able to use the benchmarks to help us distinguish those changes due to climate, uh, from those that may be happening due to human activities in the adjacent areas. Uh, the different metrics of climate change that we've used allow us to look both at um, the relative stability, if you like, of a given benchmark area, but also its ability to act as, um, to, to uh, so from a refugia perspective, but also its ability to serve um, and meet the needs of species who will be moving across the landscape under climate change. And those are the climate velocity indices that were incorporated into the assessment. So we're definitely not um, assuming or managing for stability in the benchmarks. It's very much recognizing it as a dynamic process. Thanks. Somebody asked about the um, shapefiles, hydrological ecoregion, the ecoregion um, shapefiles, but you addressed where people can find them on that website. So we got that covered. Next question, does Canada have climate divisions similar to those found in the United States? I think we need elaboration of that question. Um, <laughs> what are, yeah, division, climate maybe, division, maybe that. The climate divisions okay. isn't a term really that, um, that I'm familiar with at least. Okay, maybe um, Peter can expand on that in the chat or raise his hand. And Miles, I see you have your hand raised, so I'm going to unmute you to ask your question. Oh, thanks. I was Miles, just curious if the other LCCs were planning a similar analysis for like a full coverage of Alaska going into Canada, or if that's um, kind of a, in the future type plan. Mm -hmm. Well, Amy may, may wish to speak to that. Um, uh, certainly, you know, there's potential to expand this work into the LCCs. Uh, I think as everybody's aware that the LCCs are facing some challenges these days um, with, um, well, for a variety of reasons, with uh, politics in the U.S. largely, but uh, there was a meeting uh, several weeks ago in Anchorage for the LCCs across Alaska to talk about coordinating efforts, and there's a number of interesting initiatives coming out from there. Um, Amy, do you want to say anything further on that? Uh, thanks, Sue, and I think you covered that well. <clears throat> um, at this time, there's no plans in the works to expand this, but um, Certainly, that could be a possibility. And Amy, since we have you on the phone, do you have um, any questions for folks in the room that you're with? Yeah, we have a question in Fairbanks. Hi, thank you. This is Roger Kay at Fairbanks. Uh, every time I see a presentation like this, and this is very good, it's interesting, but it reminds me of how complex and technical resource management and planning has become. And I'm just wondering, given this trend, uh, is it tending to limit the ability of the non-specialist and particularly the rural residents to understand and engage and participate in, in resource planning? I think that's an excellent question. Um, and, you know, 
part of our rationale for wanting to now invest in outreach efforts is to make this work in particularly more accessible to that wide range of, of audiences and to enable participation. Um, and, you know, clearly if we were communicating this work to uh, a community audience, we'd be doing it in a very different way. And I think a lot of these concepts can be stripped down um, to sort of the basic underlying philosophy, much as I closed off. And then a lot of the technical detail is really just supporting. We have had success in, in communicating these concepts across, um, you know, a variety of interest groups throughout Boreal Canada in particular. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the that this does resonate with a broad audience. Um, I appreciate that, yeah, there's a lot of technical detail here and certainly resource management and land use planning has, has gone down that path. Um, on the other hand, these are supporting tools and this is really creating scenarios, recognizing that ultimately it's a public participation process that will or will not utilize this sort of work. And so, um, you know, there's a real incentive, us, incentive for us to make sure that, that the work is accessible. Any other questions here in Fairbanks? All right, no other questions here in Fairbanks right now. Thank you. Benson, for using the phone, um, are there any questions from Anchorage? No questions quite yet. We got one question. Sorry, I, I was thinking if I should ask this question or not. Um, so just to kind of tie it, tie it up in a bow and make this as simplistic as possible is the hope that we can use these benchmarks or the highly ranked benchmarks um, when we're considering our planning to recommend areas that should have higher protection or should be avoided for development or where management should change to reflect the changing environment. Yeah, certainly applications in in all of those ways and so you know the the intent is to create um, a range of scenarios that could be used in a variety of planning processes um, could be for or could be for protection it could be for special management it might be to look at vulnerability of existing areas um, so much as our assessment of existing protected areas uh, was evaluating their vulnerability to external pressures, you could similarly apply that approach to any particular landscape of, of interest. Where we are right now is we've identified, you know, those benchmarks and I'm, I'm curious about um, who we will now target as the end users so that we can see the reality of all this great work that you've put together. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that the users are broad with this. Um, and so, you know, certainly in regional planning exercises or other um, planning exercises for, uh, for conservation areas. Um, but really this needs to go out, as, as I mentioned, you know, this is really about shared stewardship of these landscapes. And so essentially this, the communication on this needs to reach all of those audiences from industry, through government agencies, through local communities, indigenous groups, conservation organizations, um, essentially everybody who's interested in the outcomes for these, these regions. So it's probably a pretty easy sell for those who've been engaged, you know, the folks with the refuges and with BLM and, and in Canada, the various conservation organizations, but that next step might be a little bit more challenging. Has there been much discussion on reaching out to industry and to communities? Yes, there has been. Uh, we, we had two internal webinars prior to this with the, with the steering committee for the Northwest Boreal LCC, just two different ones because of the, the timing of dates and availability of people. And certainly that came out as, a, as one of the strong recommendations was to make sure that, that we were creating materials and, and investing in outreach activities to target those, those different groups and audiences. And if I could just take a minute actually to speak to the application of some of this work more broadly in Canada, um, one of the initiatives that uh, that we've worked with is called the Canadian Borough Forest Agreement, and that consists of, of a handful of conservation organizations, but also all the member uh, member companies of the Forest Products Association of Canada, um, and that covers about 80% of all the managed forest lands in Canada, uh, a conservation planning region of um, 750,000 square kilometers, and um, 
they were very actively engaged in this work. Uh, we're, we're also about to release something called the Pan Boreal Assessment, which was undertaken as, as part of our work with the Canadian Boreal Forest Agreement. And the forest industry saw the value uh, here in terms of, of um, helping them understand the sustainability of their operations over time. And so that had part to do with, with uh, commitments under their forest management agreements and government agencies, but there's also a marking incentive uh, with forest certification, for example, them being able to actually demonstrate that their practices are um, uh, maintaining the, the various environmental values and other values for these regions is a real selling point for them with, uh, with market procurements. So really maintaining that social, social license piece that people talk about now. As a re uh, response to the question um, asked by an attendee, uh, does Canada have any climate divisions similar to those found in the US? Um, uh, Peter responded, said each state in the United States has specific climate divisions where long-term climate data define the climate normal. Uh, I don't think there's quite the same divisions. Natural Resource Canada has has a huge capacity in terms of, of climate work. I don't know if David Price is on the line. Uh, he's part of the steering committee for the LCC and he would be best positioned to talk about any sort of equivalent uh, organizational structures in Canada. I'm not seeing the attendee list right now, so I'm not sure if, if David's there. Yeah, um, David's on. David's on there. I can unmute him and see if he'd like to. David, I just unmuted you if you have something to add. Perhaps he walked away from his desk too. <laughs> a possibility. Yeah. We can, we can so, follow up. Okay. I, we can follow up on that question. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, I have no more questions in the queue. And um, I don't see any hands raised, so I think, and we're just a little bit beyond the hour, so it might be a good time to wrap up if, if you guys are ready. Absolutely. All right, thanks, Mary. Um, thank you to everyone who's joined us here in Fairbanks, in Anchorage, and on the phone. Um, this is Amy again in Fairbanks. Um, we will be following up with everyone who's joined today after the webinar with the recording, and also, um, a short survey or other way to get your your input on regarding your interest in learning more about beacons. Um, there may be opportunities for follow-up um, training on how to use the, the tool. Um, so stay tuned for that, hopefully later this week. And thank you again to Fiona and Kim for an excellent presentation today. Thank you, Amy. And Mary. But yeah, thanks everybody for attending and to the speaker. So everybody enjoy your day and hopefully we'll see you on the next webinar. Goodbye. Thank you, you too.